Good morning. Good morning. Mm. And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> well, Sharon, <laughs> I want to thank you for that song. I, I can just imagine the angels in heaven singing along. And I got to say, I'm sorry, I'm not leaving, but I am planning on going on an extended vacation. So please forgive the luggage. We'll put it over to the side here. Because you see, I begin to pack my bags. And as I was packing my bags, I realized packing is hard work. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not easy. You got to fold everything, put it in its place. And I remember when I was little, when you're little, you have it so easy. And you see, when I was little, I, I, I believed that my bags packed themselves. <laughs> I wasn't crazy, but, but listen to what happened. I would go, be going to my grandma's, and my mom would be like, hey, honey, don't, don't forget your bags. And there they were, perfectly right by the door, already packed. So all I'd have to do is just pick up my bags, go to grandma, grandma's house. And when I got to grandma's house, I'd open up my luggage. And there in my luggage was anything and everything a little boy could ever desire. It was perfect. But then, you know, as you continue living life, you begin doing something. And it's called growing up. And I don't know how it happens, it just, it just happens. You know, one day you grow up and they start calling you an adult. It's scary. <laughs> don't, don't do it. And one day, I, be, I realized that my bags, they didn't pack themselves. I mean, you see, like, I could beg them, I could talk to them nicely, I could even pray about it, but my bags wouldn't pack themselves. I would have to get down and I would have to pack my bags. And what was even worse, I soon realized that when you go on a long vacation, it takes longer to pack. Has anybody here ever gone on like, a mission trip or gone on a very long trip? You understand, you, you can't just pack the night before. And I know for me, when I was in college, I used to work at a summer camp called Sunset Lake, and it was in Washington State, all the way up north. And I'd be there for three months. And when I, and when I would pack, it would, I'd be there for three months, but it would take me almost a month to pack. Because it gave me like the checklist, and I know my first time I was like, I've never done this before. I don't know if I'm going to bring everything. So I, I spend just nights nice going through a checklist. Okay, do I have everything? I, I don't know. I mean, it's three months. So how, how do I know how to pack, you know? So it would take me one month to pack for three months. And I learned something. The longer you're going to be somewhere, the longer it's going to take you to pack. And my friends, that's why I'm packing my bags now. Because I plan to be with Jesus for a thousand years. Yes. And my friends... The invitation is to you too. And the awesome thing is that itinerary is found in Revelation chapter 20. And in Revelation chapter 20, we see the itinerary. But before we can read our itinerary, before we can see the vacation, the thousand year trip that we're going to spend with Jesus, Let's have a word of prayer. Let's welcome in God's presence. So bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, my Lord and my God, Lord, right now, this moment, this message, this time is yours. Lord, I pray that everything I say, every scripture I quote, will just bring honor and glory to you, Lord. Lord, hide me behind your cross. And Lord, may everything just bring you glory, Lord. Lord, we love you, and may all the honor, glory, and praise be unto you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So in Revelation 20, in Revelation 20, we see the itinerary to our new vacation. And let's read. In Revelation 20, we're going to read verses 1 to 6, because I want us to see the full picture of our vacation. Because I, when I go to vacation, I like to know where I'm going, you know? So here we see in Revelation 1, verse 6, the, the itinerary of what we're going to do. And it says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key of the, to the abyss, holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that, ser that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years had ended. 
After that, he must be free for a short time. In verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark. On their forehead or on their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This was the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God in Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. I don't know about you, but this sounds way better than summer camp. <laughs> but I, I gotta apologize because I got so excited about talking about our vacation that I forgot about how we're gonna get there. Because I mean, what's the point of having an amazing vacation if you can't get there? I mean, imagine it, you win a sweepstakes and you win an all paid for vacation to Hawaii. The best condo, the best food, the best surf lessons, anything, everything you could ever want or desire. But there was one catch. They didn't pay for your flight. So you had the best vacation, but you had no way of getting there. Well, let's take a moment let's, and let's go back one, ver one chapter to chapter 19 and let's see how we're going to get to our vacation. Because as we're going to see, Jesus not only paid the price for our vacation, but he is personally going to deliver us there. So read with me in Revelation 19, verse 11. And in Revelation 19, verse 11, it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and, make war and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but God. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on the white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. You know what's interesting as we read this? We see an image of God we don't, or an image of Jesus we don't normally see. Because normally when we think of Jesus, we see the lamb that was slain or a loving God, but here we see Jesus as a warrior, as a king of kings, and as a lord of lords. But why is that? Well, you see, if you go with me to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to see why when Jesus comes back in the clouds, he's going to come as a king of kings, and as a lord of lords, and as a warrior to deliver his people. Because look with me in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it reads, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, <clears throat> will be delivered. So what do we see here? We see that before Jesus comes, there's going to be a time of distress. And this morning, I don't have time to go much into detail of it. But if you're interested and you want to learn more, there's a book called The Great Controversy. Amen. And I'd like to invite you to read chapters 39 and 40. And it will go great in detail to what I'm about to explain to you. But you see, before Jesus comes, there's going to be a time of distress. There's going to be the last days. And what's going to happen is the books will be closed. Those who are good will be good. Those who are saved will be saved. And those who are bad will be bad. Those who are lost will be lost. And during this time, it says there will be persecution like there has never been. And the reason Jesus is coming back as a warrior, as a king of kings, as lords of lords, is because for 6,000 years, there has been a great war going on. And the war has been going on over his people. And you see, here Jesus comes to finish the war, 
Because at this time, the good people are going to be good and the bad people are going to be bad. And at this time, he says, enough is enough. I'm coming for my people. And in spirit of prophecy, in the, in the great controversy, it says that right before Jesus comes, that the bad people, the evil doers, will be right around surrounding God's people and about to eliminate them. And right when their guns are drawn, right when they're about to eliminate God's people, Jesus steps in. Amen. My friends, that's why Jesus is coming as a King of kings and as a Lord of lords, because he's the only redeemer we need. But let's see what happens. <clears throat> let's see what happens after Jesus comes. So he comes, he rescues his people, but what happens next? Well, continue with me in verse 12. So Daniel 12, verse 2. Sorry, Dan Daniel 12, verse 2. And it says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of earth will wake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And then now turn with me to the New Testament, to 1 Thessalonians. To 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 13 to 18, we see what will happen when Jesus comes. And in verse 13 it says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Amen. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. But let's read one more verse. I want us to go to Revelation chapter 1. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, we once again see what will happen when Jesus comes back in the clouds. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, it reads, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him, and the people of earth will mourn because of him. You see, when I was in high school, during, uh, during my BC years, my before conversion and before Christ years, I had some friends and they, they weren't Adventists. They were good people, they were good Christians, they loved Jesus. And they would share with me that their greatest fear, hear me, their greatest fear wasn't persecution, wasn't witnessing, wasn't even giving their whole life to God. Their greatest persecution was being, or their greatest fear was being left behind. My friends believed in the secret rapture. But as we saw here today in the Bible, what does it say? Is there going to be anything secret about it? No. It says every eye will see him and every ear will hear him. And what, what makes me mad about the secret rapture is not only that I don't see it in the Bible, but it's the fact of what kind of God would we have if he did a secret rapture? I mean, can you imagine it? What, is God in heaven? He's in his throne and he looks over at Jesus and he says, you know, I, th I think it's time for them to come here. Can you, can you bring them here and just snap, snap, and then boop, we're all up in heaven? What, what, why kind of God would we serve? But no, we see that the same Jesus, the Jesus that died on the cross for you and for me, is personally going to come back to the earth. Because when he saves his people, he wants to be the first to see you. You know, I hear all the time, you know, when I, when I, um, when I am resurrected, when I come out of the grave, I'm going to be looking for you. And I want you to say, it doesn't matter who's looking for you, because I can tell you who's going to be looking for you. And that's Jesus Christ. Because my friends, Jesus Christ has not only paid the price for your vacation for a thousand years in heaven with him, but he's personally going to deliver you there. And my friends, from what we see here, you're not going to have to worry. 
You won't have to be afraid. It's not like you're going to be mowing your lawn one day or, you know, washing your dishes in your house and your neighbor's going to come over to you and be like, hey, the coolest thing happened. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity. You totally missed it. And you'd be like, what? And they'd be like, Jesus Christ came back. Man, I don't know how you missed it. Because here we see that every eye will see him and every ear will hear him. And so what will happen? We see that Jesus is going to come in the last days and he's going to save his people. And when he saves his people, as we saw in Daniel 12, verse 2, the wicked and the righteous will be resurrected. Even those who have pierced Jesus will see him in the clouds. But then what happens next? It says that those who have fallen in Christ, who have fallen asleep in Christ, that they will be resurrected, or they will, they will be lifted up. And then those of us who survived the last days, we will follow after them, and we'll get to be in heaven with Jesus. My friends, that's why I'm packing my bags today. Because when Jesus comes to my front door, I want to be ready. Amen. I don't want anything in this earth I don't want to let anything in my life keep me from being re ready to see my Savior. So here we see what happens to the righteous. But what happens to, what happens to the wicked? What happens to after we go to heaven for a thousand years? Well, the awesome thing is that the Bible explains itself. Turn with me back to Revelation 19. And in Revelation 19, we're going, to read verses seven, we're going to start at verse 17. And in Revelation 19, verse 17, it says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in the midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of the king's and generals and mighty men of horses and their riders, and of the flesh of all the people, free and slaves, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the king of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider, against Jesus, Jesus on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of the burning sulfur. The rest were killed with a sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Now turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 25. In Jeremiah 25, verses 30, and verse 33, it says, Jeremiah 25, verse 33, it says, At that time, those slain by the Lord will be everywhere, from one end of the earth to the other. They will not be mourned over or gathered up or buried, but they will be like refuse, lying on the ground. <laughs> and finally, go with me to Jeremiah 4. Verse 23 and 26. And in Jeremiah 4, verses 23 and 26, it reads, I look at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked, and there was no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All the towns laid in ruin before the Lord, before his furious anger. Then this is what the Lord says, the whole land will be ruined, though I will not completely destroy it. So here we see what is going to happen after Jesus comes back. We see that the righteous, that those who love Jesus, who have given their life to Jesus, will be lifted up and will be with him for a thousand years. But for those who have rejected Jesus, that they will perish. And it says that the world, the earth, will be formless. And we see, so we see here what's going to happen to the wicked when Jesus comes. But my question is, what happens to the fallen angels? What happens to Satan? Well, go back with me to Revelation 20. 
And in Revelation 20, verse 1, we see what's going to happen to Satan during this time. And in Revelation 20, verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the keys to the abyss, holding in his hands a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until a thousand years were ended. After that, he must be free for a short, short time. So what happens to Satan? Um, he is put in the ultimate timeout. Because you see, since, the great, since this great controversy has started, since for, for 6,000 years, Satan has been roaming like a roaring lion. And you see, for the first time in this whole great controversy, Satan has time to think. So you see, during this time, he's been busy trying to mislead people, to deceive people, to tempt people. And finally, he's left for a thousand years to look at what he's done. It's the ultimate time out. And as he's on the earth, which is formless, that is left in ruin, with all the evil, all the wicked people destroyed, all the people he said, follow me, trust me, he sees where his sin has led them. And as he's on the earth for a thousand years, he sees what the result of sin is. So here we see that Satan will be in the ultimate timeout. But what will we be doing in heaven? What will we be doing for a thousand years? And this is the best part. Because I believe we'll be doing two things. First one we see is in Revelation 21 verse 4. And it says, He, God, will wipe away every tear from their eye. My friends, when we go to heaven, we are going to be in the best rehab you could ever be in. Because hear me out. Because on this earth, we have been scarred. We have been messed up. Sin has messed us up. But when we go to heaven, God, Jesus himself, is going to wipe away every tear. He's going to heal all those broken wounds. He's going he's to show you who he is. He's going to be like, you've been reading about me, you've been learning about me, but now see me in the flesh, who I am. But you see, we'll also be doing something else. Turn with me back to Revelation 20, verse 4. And it says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Then going down to verse, <clears throat> to verse 6, it said, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The first death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. My friends, when we're in heaven, we're going to be a part of something called the investigative judgment. And you see, Paul talked about it in his books. If you go to 1 Corinthians with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 5. We, see, we, we begin to see a picture of what we will do during this a thousand years. In verse 5 it says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time each will receive his praise from God. Now flip a few pages with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 3, we get a, we get a greater picture to what will be doing during the thousand years. If any of you ha have any dispute with one another, dare he take it before, an un before the ungodly, for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? So my friends, when we're when we're in heaven during this a thousand years, we'll be part of an investigative judgment. And in the Great Controversy, page 354, it says, In unison with Christ, they judge the wicked, comparing their acts with the status book, the Bible, and deciding every case according to the deed done in the body. 
And why are we doing this? Well, you see, there's two reasons. When we get to heaven, we're going to have questions. When we get to heaven, just imagine it. You get to heaven, and not to pick anybody, but Aunt Sue Bob. And if you have an Aunt Sue Bob, I'm sorry. <laughs> I try to make up a name. But you get to heaven, and Aunt Sue Bob isn't there. And she was a professed Christian. She went to Sabbath school. She went to church. And you're like, God, why, why is Aunt Sue Bob not here? And we'll get an opportunity to open the books. And we'll get to go through her life and see in her life where she had rejected God. But see, again, we'll, go up, we'll be in heaven as we're walking around. We'll see someone. And we'll see that certain person. And we're like, how did you get here? And we're going to ask them, be like, weren't they, weren't they checking IDs on the way in? How, how did you get here? And we'll have an opportunity to go back to the books and to see where in that person's life they decide to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And finally, there's one thing that I cannot wait. We'll be walking down the streets of golden heaven, and there in front of us will be that loved one, that friend, that friend family member that you've been praying for day and night and who you might die or maybe they died you never thought they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and yet there they are and we'll be able to go back to the books and we'll be able to see where God answered our prayers because my friends God answers prayers <laughs> that's why I can't wait to be up there but you see, there's a second reason. As beautiful as this first reason was, there's a second reason to why we're going to be part of this investigative judgment. And I want to be honest with you, when I first heard about judgment, when I first saw the second coming when I was little, it scared me. Because like judgment, oh, I'm bad. I, I stole some cookies out of the cookie jar. I know, you know, I know I've done some bad stuff and people are going to be looking at my life. Well, I want you to know something. The judgment isn't about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. The judgment isn't about us, but the judgment is about God. Because you see, for 6,000 years, the devil has been trying to tell the world that God's not just, that God truly isn't love, that his government is unfair. And you see, we're not the one on trial. God is. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to be witnesses. And we're going to be able to go through the books and, and say, God, you are loving. You are just. And we'll be able to say what, the, what is said in Revelation 16, verse 5 and 7. In 16, verse 5, says, says, You are just in these judgments. You who are, who were the Holy One. Because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. When we get to heaven, we'll get to see for ourselves that Jesus, that God, is just and loving. But what happens next? We've been in heaven for a thousand years. God has mended our broken hearts. We've seen the books for ourselves. What happens next? Exactly. Let's continue. Let's go back to Revelation 20. So flip a few pages with me. And go with me to Revelation 20, verse 7. And we see what's going to happen after this a thousand years is over. In Revelation 20, verse 7, it says, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations. He didn't learn. He was in time out for a thousand years. But yet he goes back to doing what he's been doing since the very beginning. And he says, He goes out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, the whole earth, Gog and Mogag, to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand of the seashore. They march across the British of the earth and surround the camp of God's people, the city he loves. Which city is that? It's the New Jerusalem. And who's in the city? God's people. Exactly. And I want to read to you a quote from The Great Controversy, page 355. And I want you to see how the devil deceives these people for the last time. It reads, 
Yet true to his early cunning, he does not acknowledge himself to be Satan. He claims to be the prince who is, rightful, who is the rightful owner of the world and whose inheritance has been unlawfully risked from him. He represents himself to his deluded subjects as a redeemer, assuring them that his power has brought them forth from their grave and that he is about to rescue them from the most cruel tyranny. We need to be careful because Satan is the father of all lies. And if he can deceive the people at the very end, he could deceive us today, which is why we need to be in God's word. But I want you to see, this is my, one of my favorite parts in the whole Bible because as the whole world is against God, I want you to see what happens. It says they're surrounding the camp of God's people, the city he loves, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of the burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You see what happened? When the whole world, when Satan and all these angels are surrounding God's people, when it looks hopeless for them, God delivers. And I want you to know, if you feel surrounded right now, if you feel like there's no way out, if God can deliver you from the whole world, <laughs> he can deliver you from whatever you're in right now. But I want you to see, because now we're going to take a step back, because now we're going to see the final judgment, because before fire rains down, there is a final judgment. Everyone's going to see for themselves that God is just. So going with me to verse 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. The deaf in Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death in Hades, death itself, was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And I want to be honest, can I, can I be honest with you for a second? When I first read this, I was terrified. Because I was thinking, man, I'm a sinner. I'm a mess. I'm a wretch. How do I know if my name is going to be in the book of life? But then I found out that the judgment isn't about us. It's about him. And I begin to study the sanctuary service of the Israelites, and I begin to remember what the Israelites would have to do if they sinned. And if you don't know what would happen was, after you sinned, you'd have to grab, you have to get a lamb without blemish. And you would have to walk down the camp. And I can only imagine as you were walking down the camp, every eye was on you. Because they were saying, oh man, we have ourselves a sinner. I wonder what he did this time. You know, every eye is on you. But as this, this is an amazing thing. If you're asleep, if, please wake up. Just listen to this one thing. Because as you walked into the sanctuary, as you walked in the sanctuary, the attention shifted from you to the lamb. Because you see, when you walked in the sanctuary, the priest didn't look at you. He didn't look at your imperfection. He looked at the lamb. He looked at the lamb. And my friends, the same way. When it comes to the book of life, when it comes to having eternal life, when it comes to being with Jesus, it's not about you or me. It's not about what we do, not about how many homeless people we feed. It's about Jesus. And it's about receiving his sacrifice. So my friends, if you want your name to be in the book of life, it's one of the most easy, but one of the most difficult things. And that's to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because you see, you will never get in the book of life by your own merit by what you do, by what you've done, about who you are, because it doesn't matter. 
All that matters is him. Amen. It's Jesus. And the amazing thing is that Jesus is not only paid for our vacation with his own blood, but he is going to personally deliver us there. And my friends, today my question is, have you picked up your ticket? Are you going to be of Jesus? Have you begun to pack your bags? Because, you see, your bags aren't going to pack themselves. No matter how much you plead, no matter how much you beg, your bags aren't going to pack themselves. My friends, your life isn't going to give itself to Jesus. You have to. And as I read this, I want to tell you the thing I'm most scared of isn't judgment, but it's myself. Because you see, the only thing that can keep me from picking up the ticket, from start packing my bags, is me. And that's why daily you need to surrender your life to Jesus. Amen. You need to pick up his sacrifice and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm not righteous, but Lord, you are. Because my friends, our bags aren't going to pack themselves. So today, if you want to go on an extended vacation, if you want to be with Jesus for not only a thousand years, but for an eternity, if you want to be with your best friend, your Lord and your Savior, I invite you to pick up the ticket, to give God your whole life, to not let anything separate you from Him. And if there's something that's separating you from Him, give it away. What in this world is worth losing Jesus? And my friends, if there's stuff in your life that, that you kept, that you need to pack away, that you need to give up, give it to Jesus. Pack your bags so that when he comes in the clouds, when he comes to your front door, you'll be ready. You see, it's my prayer that when we all get to heaven, we'll all get to say together, worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Let's pray. Dimly Father, my God, Lord, thank you so much for giving us the ultimate gift, your Son, Lord. And Lord, right now, if there's anybody on the sound of my voice who hasn't given their life to you, well, Lord, I pray that right now that your Holy Spirit begins to touch their heart, Lord. And Lord, if there's anything in our lives, is there anything in my life, there's anybody in anyone's life that is keeping us from you, Lord, Lord, take it away. We want to be all yours. And Lord, we know that it's only through you that our names will be written in the book of life. So Lord, today, take our lives and cover us in the blood of your Son. Lord, we love you so much and we can't wait to, be, to live in eternity with you, Lord. In your name I pray, amen.